Hi everybody and welcome to this revision video on research designs as part of stage 2 psychology, the science inquiry skills or SIS. Let's get started. So a research design is the way in which data is collected, usually based on the setting. So data is collected using one or more investigation designs in psychology. So a design is the way in which an investigation is set up or designed, hence the term. And like I said, it's usually dependent on uh, where it's done and it also depends on the hypothesis or the question of the researcher as to which design or how the experiment or investigation is designed as to which one we go with. So we've got options in psychology, which is good. So there are three types of research designs that you need to know about. Experimental, observational and qualitative. So let's go through each of them in more detail. So an experimental design is probably the one that you are the most familiar with as science students. So when you've been in labs um, at school, when you've been doing, you know, different sciences uh, throughout the years, you would have been in an experimental design, a controlled lab with a lab coat and a very systematic method or numbered method where you are in complete control of everything. You may have a control and an experimental um, trial, etc. but you are in control of everything. So we use the same design in psychology as well, and it's called an experimental design. So there's different variations of this, all right, due to sampling of the population. So obviously in psychology, we're working with people and animals. So we need to adapt our experimental designs uh, to cater for whatever it is that we're actually investigating. So the most common is what we call an independent groups design. So we have a control group and an experimental group that are randomly allocated. And this is, again, like I said, the most common type because the more random the groups are in terms of being allocated, the more likely it is that the groups will be representative. So ideally, we try and randomly allocate our participants to have just as much likelihood of ending up in the control versus the experimental group because then the groups are more likely to be equivalent and there's not going to be any bias in any way. So there's not going to be too many males or females or too much of a particular age range or job title, etc. All right, they'll be representative of the population. So usually the control group does not receive the independent variable, whereas the independent group does as a means for comparison. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Another type of experimental design we have is something called matched participants design. So this is when we deliberately allocate our participants with similar characteristics to each group. So for example, the two highest scoring participants on a memory test, one placed in group A, the other in group B. So we match the pairs, in other words, and then uh, purposefully or deliberately put one of them in group A and the other in group B. So this may be very necessary, especially when we're doing things like memory tests to make sure that the groups aren't um, accidentally biased if we were to randomly allocate them, as I talked about before. We also have a repeated measures design. So you, this is uses the same participants who are exposed to different experimental conditions. Now, the Little Albert study is an example of this. We would have gone through this in year 11 if you did year 11 psychology with me. So Little Albert obviously was the same participant. He was exposed to different conditions. So he was first exposed to the white rat and the other stimuli like the rabbit, the dog, the fur coat, the white mask, etc., showing no fear. He was then exposed to the loud noise um, every time he was presented with the white rat, and then he was presented with the rat again once the conditioning had taken place. So the experiment was repeated, all right, in order to get more data and make sure that there was a correlation between, in that example, the noise paired with the rat and Little Albert's fear. So the repeated measures design is when we use the same participants who are exposed to different experimental conditions, all right, but the same participants are used and it's repeated several times to ensure consistency. Okay, so more detail on the experimental design. The example that I'm going to really talk about as we go forward, it applies to all of them pretty much, but it's definitely more applicable to the independent groups design because that's the one that's most commonly used, as I said. So whenever we use an experimental design, it's used to test whether one variable or factor influences or causes a change in another variable. So in a controlled experiment, like I talked about before, so independent groups design, we have a control group which does not receive the treatment. They do not receive the IV. And then the experimental group 
does receive the treatment or the IV. So the presence of the control group is just as important, all right, as the experimental group because it provides a standard of comparison against which the researcher can compare the group's results in order to determine if the IV has actually had an effect. So if we don't have a control group or a controlled trial, we've got nothing to compare the results to. So this is often standard practice when we do experimental designs in psychology. Now, often the participants don't actually know which group they're allocated to. So this is to ensure that participant expectations don't influence the results. So in my previous video, I talked about different types of extraneous variables. So if the participants actually know what group they're a part of, it may influence the results and cause the results to be less than accurate. So they're called demand characteristics. So where possible and where ethical, of course, participants often won't know which group they're allocated to. This is, again, very common in drug trials. So this process is called a single blind procedure. So what that means is the participant is blind to what group they're actually a part of. Now, as part of the single blind procedure, the experimenter will know what group uh, each participant is allocated to, but the participant will not, as to not influence the results in a negative way. But when both the participants and the experimenter are unaware of the allocation of the independent variable, this is called a double blind procedure. And again, this is to try and eliminate as many extraneous variables as possible. So again, in my previous video, I talked about how the researcher can actually influence the results in a negative way sometimes. So often a double blind procedure will be used. So there's no in unintentional bias from the experimenter or the participants when doing an experiment. Now, another characteristic of an experimental design is a controlled setting. So they're usually done, not always, but most of the time done in a controlled conditions or done in controlled conditions, I should say, such as a laboratory or a room where the experimenter and the researchers have complete control. This does not necessarily mean that they're conducted inside. All right. So some may be done outside, but it's still in a controlled area. So for example, if I wanted to examine the effects of coffee on reaction times, we may keep them in a laboratory to observe the effects of caffeine on their reactions to certain stimuli. But if I wanted to do an actual driving test, so I wanted to look at, you know, for example, coffee or caffeine on driving awareness and reaction time and, you know, driver maneuverability or something like that, I would then take my participants out outside, obviously, and get them behind the wheel of a car. Now, it wouldn't necessarily be ideal to just let them, you know, go free on, you know, the main roads or the real world. So it would be up to me as a researcher to actually conduct that experiment on a closed track, all right, where I would set up certain obstacles and certain um, challenges for them, still in a controlled way, but it would just be outside. It wouldn't be on the main roads or in the real world. So... Not all experimental designs are done inside, is what I'm saying. We can do experiments outside, still in a controlled way, on a you know closed track or circuit or something like that. All right, another unique characteristic of an experimental design is random assignment or random allocation. Both these terms are correct. So, like I said before, participants are just as likely to end up in the experimental group as the control group. OK, and again, if I just go back, that is unique to the independent groups design. There we go. So the goal is to obtain groups that are as alike as possible in terms of characteristics before the independent variable is introduced. So again, making the groups equivalent as possible is going to reduce um, extraneous variables. It won't be perfect, but it was a very, very important step in the scientific method. So we can conclude if our groups are equivalent, that any change in behaviour, thoughts or feelings as a result of the IV, which is what we want, like I said before, we don't want another variable like a participant characteristic to influence the results in a negative way. So let's recap. Ex essential, essential, sorry, characteristics of experimental designs. There's always the presence of a control group. Random assignment or allocation for independent groups design is very common. There, we're always testing a hypothesis, so we're always having a testable prediction with at least one independent and dependent variable. Often there is pre and post testing. Now, what I mean by this is that it is very controlled, as we know. So we will look at repeating the experiment several times. So we'll get some results or we'll do some trials before the independent variable is introduced. 
and then do other tests after the independent variable has been introduced. So pre and post testing, so before and after the IV. Because it is so controlled, we can replicate the experiment several times, which is very necessary in psychology. So we will do the same research or the same experiment or investigation with several sample sizes around the world, ideally, if that's applicable, and we will replicate or repeat, in other words, the experiment several times. Because experimental designs are so controlled, this makes it easier. So we can you know, have the same room, the same conditions, same instructions, etc and repeat our results several times, which is a good thing. That can lead to then us establishing what we call cause and effect. So we can establish this with an experimental design only, no other design. So if we then can establish a cause and effect, we can then conclude that the independent variable has caused an effect on the dependent variable, hence cause and effect, you know, the term. Now, this is only unique to an experimental design, no other design, okay? But it's often seen to be more valid or more accurate when we can establish cause and effect. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of experimental research designs? So the advantages are that it maximizes control over extraneous variables affecting the dependent variable due to the highly controlled nature, as I said. So because we can control so many factors, we can control where it's done, the procedure it's done, obviously random allocation, we've got that control over the IV and several other factors. So we can reduce a lot of extraneous variables more so than the other designs with uh, experimental. We can determine cause and effect, all right, like I said before, and that makes it more likely that our results will be moderately valid, at least. The controlled setting allows for easier replication of the experiment. So we can do the experiment several times in the same conditions to ensure reliable results. But it's not perfect, okay? So there are some issues or problems with using an experimental design. It may be very unethical to manipulate certain variables or randomly allocate participants. So, for example, it may not be very, very ethical for me to randomly allocate children, one group to, you know, not play violent video games and another to play violent video games. It may traumatise them, it may, you know, have unwanted side effects. So obviously that would be an unethical practice. So the risk with experimental designs is that they tend to be more unethical because of the controlled nature. The controlled setting also may make it in, um, inapplicable to the real world. So it has what we call a lack of external validity. So validity is another word for accuracy. So we may get somewhat accurate results in a lab, but we would never get those results, or it's very unlikely that we would get those results in the real world. So that means that it lacks external validity. It wouldn't be applicable to a wide range of people, in other words. So the example that I usually give in class, um, if I have, great, if I haven't, well, here it is again. If I wanted to look at, you know, my students' natural behaviour at recess and lunch, it would be silly of me to use an experimental design because you don't often come into a lab and you're not randomly allocated and you're not told what to do in your recess and lunch breaks necessarily. So it's not really a valid way of getting data on the natural behaviour of, you know, school students at recess and lunch. So it would just be uh, impractical to use an experimental design. Also, it may not represent the entire population. There's only so many people we can fit into one space or one lab. So that reduces our sample sizing. So yes, we can replicate it with a lot of, you know, different samples and so on, but that's very time consuming and very expensive. So because of that, it limits the amount or yeah, the size of our sample and therefore representativeness, which is a problem as well. The good news is, is that we have two other designs that we can use where appropriate, where an experimental may not be the best. So the second type of design is what we call an observational design. We use this when pre-existing criteria or characteristics are present, such as gender, ethnicity, job status, etc. So what I mean by this is where if the IV is pre-existing, okay, so the independent variable is, for example, gender, ethnicity, job status, etc. We obviously can't manipulate that. It's impossible. So straight away, if we can't manipulate the IV or it's pre-existing, we go straight to, as an option, an observational design. Other reasons why uh, we may choose this design is because it's too costly to set up an experimental design because it is very, very expensive. 
We may want to examine pre-existing characteristics anyway, okay, like I've set up here. And again, it may be too unethical to manipulate the IV. So the example that I just said before, it would be too unethical to randomly allocate children into groups to play violent video games if they've never been exposed to them before. So then I would use children who have already played violent video games and children who have never played them previously. So rather than me introducing the IV, I would find participants where the IV is already pre-existing. So find children who already play violent video games. So I'm not deliberately, you know, traumatizing them and children who have never played them previously, like I said. But one of the main unique characteristics of an observational design, which I get into later, is it's done in the natural setting of the participants. So it's not done in a controlled setting like a lab, like experimental. It's done in the natural setting of the children's homes or school or workplace, etc. So we simply observe the behaviour that we're looking for, hence the term observational. So observational designs do have some similar characteristics to an experimental research design. So both can still have an IV and a DV. Both can still have a control group. It's just it's pre-existing, obviously, with uh, observational designs. And both can be done in a somewhat controlled way. So again, if we're observing behaviour in someone's home or in someone's school, there are still controls that we can have. We just don't have as much control with um, observational designs, but both can be done sort of in, uh, sorry, yeah, both can be done in a controlled way. We just don't have as much control with observational designs. And again, both can still have a control group. So if I just go back to this example, my control group in this example would be children who have never played violent video games. So that's my control group. And then my experimental is those who already play violent video games. So there are similarities. However, they are quite different um, in other ways to experimental designs in that the IV is not manipulated, it is pre-existing with observational design. So we're not manipulating anything. The groups are not randomly allocated. Again, they're pre-existing. Usually they're done in the natural setting of participants for a naturalistic observational design. But one of the most important things or differences, I should say, is that we can't imply causation or cause and effect, in other words, with observational designs. Because we have very little control, we can't say for sure that there is um, yeah, a cause and effect between the IV and the DV. There's just not enough control. So we can never imply causation or cause and effect with this design. So essential characteristics of observational designs, again, independent variable is not manipulated, it's pre-existing, or it's just too unethical to manipulate or change. It allows the research to be done in a natural setting of participants, so their natural home, school, workplace, etc., or just out and about in society. And we can determine associations between variables, but we cannot determine cause and effect. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of this design? The advantages, obviously, it allows studies of variables that are too unethical or impossible or costly to manipulate. So violent video games is an example. All right. So we can still study that um, far more ethically and um, mindfully, and we can still get data on the particular topic that we want to, which is good. Human behaviour can be observed in a natural setting. It may be that it's just a more appropriate design to get a more realistic interpretation of participant behaviour. So going back to my example before, if I wanted to look at your, you know, my students' natural behaviours at recess and lunch, it would make sense to use this design, not an experimental design. I can go out and watch what my, you know, students do and write down what they're doing. It's going to be far more realistic rather than confining them to a lab. So natural setting behaviours is what we can um, get from using this design, obviously. It may allow for bigger sample sizes, okay? So we can often go, you know, into entire schools, entire workplaces where we can observe hundreds of participants or thousands even of participants' behaviour. So we can have more sample sizes, making it more likely that it's representative. And because of that, we're more likely to have higher external validity. So it's going to be more accurate external to the experiment itself. So it's going to be more realistic results, in other words, and can be applied to a wide variety of people. However, there are some problems. We can't infer cause and effect relationship, all right, because this uh, design lends itself to a greater chance of extraneous variables. So often when we use observational designs, extraneous variables are very, very high, unfortunately, which reduces the validity of our results. 
It's also very, very difficult to replicate the study if we're doing a naturalistic observation. So, for example, I might go out and, you know, observe student behaviour at lunchtime on a Monday, but they may not do the same thing on the Tuesday or the Wednesday. I've got no control over that. So my, you know, results are going to be inconsistent, all right, and it's hard to replicate it in exactly the same way because we've got no control. All we're doing is observing what participants are doing, so we've got no control, so it's hard to replicate it or repeat it in exactly the same way. And observer bias can ne uh, negatively affect the results. If participants know that they're being watched, they may change their behaviour, like I talked about in my variables video, demand characteristics of, you know, how they should and shouldn't act. So observer bias can reduce the validity of our results. Now, the third option or the third design is what we call qualitative designs. So we use this design if we want to get rich, in-depth, qualitative data. So in other words, data in word and language form about a topic. So qualitative is very, very popular. It's also very convenient and quick and it can be just as useful as the other two designs that I've talked about. So there are three main types that we need to know for year 12. So there's focus groups, the Delphi technique and interviews. So focus groups, we've talked about this in year 11 psychology, but again, a recap never hurt anybody. So focus groups are a group interview that obtains data through discussion between research participants. So participants are encouraged to talk with one another, ask questions, exchange personal experiences and points of view. All right. So it's basically people in a group having a talk about the subject at hand. Now, a facilitator guides the discussion to make sure everyone expresses their views in a respectful way and keeps the conversations targeted, constructive and beneficial for the research. So make sure you stay on topic and they're constructive rather than destructive and you don't get off track or anything like that. So as well as a facilitator, a note taker will keep notes on the discussion. So this may be through writing the responses down from the participants or typing them up. Sometimes we also record the discussion to take notes later so nothing is missed. That's very, very common. There are some ethical risks with that. But um, yeah, depending on obviously where it is and the, you know, the nature of what's being discussed, it may be more appropriate to type or write the responses or if it's okay, we can record them and then they're scribed later. So usually focus groups uh, consist of between six to ten people. It can be bigger than that, but that's typical. And a key feature of a focus group is that the participants are not experts in the field of study that they are discussing. So they're not experts in the topic that they've been given to talk about. It's just getting the general consensus or opinion on that particular subject. So the Delphi technique is a new year 12 concept. So this uses a series of self-administered questionnaires and feedback to obtain the opinion of experts in the field of interest. So that is the key word. All right, we're getting expert opinion in written format. So usually the data is in written format. We may send some questions off for a survey off to an expert. They then write their responses down or indicate their answers and then send it back to us. The experts do not need to be together to give data to the researcher, like I just said. Often experts are very, very busy, so they don't have time to gather together in a focus group, for example. So we will send the questionnaires off to them and get qualitative and meaningful data back from the expert um, at hand. So questionnaires are often used to gain consensus on the topic of focus. So if I just go back quickly to focus groups, we will or we have done a focus group already in stage two psychology. If we haven't, we will, don't worry, but you'll be doing the focus groups on your sleeping patterns and you know what you notice about not getting enough sleep and sleep deprivation. So you're not experts in sleep. However, we could also get meaningful qualitative data if we sent questions or you know we sent the same focus group questions to an expert who is a sleep specialist or a sleep doctor and get data back that way. So the main difference between focus groups and the Delphi technique is focus groups, group of six to 10 people, not experts in the actual field of study, run by a facilitator and a scribe. Delphi technique, uh, gathering the opinion to obtain um, expert qualitative data that can be used. We can also do interviews, okay? So interviews can be very, very structured. So general conversations with prompts or structured questions that the interviewer can't deviate from. 
All right, this is usually what uh, we do. So we have structured questions that we send the interviewee first so they know what they're actually answering and they shouldn't deviate from those questions. All right, so you get off topic. Sometimes it's, or you, I say usually, sometimes it depends on what the topic is. It's a combination of both. So semi-structured, so, you know, questions written ahead of time um, and asked, however, follow-up conversations may be encouraged with permission. So maybe, you know, the expert or the person that's being interviewed may say something that may prompt a question that wasn't on, you know, the script, if that makes sense. So, you know, it may prompt further discussion with permission from the person being interviewed. It can get lengthy qualitative data. However, sample is usually very, very small. So often when we try and set up interviews, we don't get very many because again, people are very, very busy. So yes, we can get lots of rich verbal data, but often the sample or the amount of people we interview is quite small, which can be a problem. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of qualitative designs? Let's go through it. So advantages can be very convenient. So setting up a focus group is very straightforward, does takes very little time at all. All right, same with sending questions and survey responses off to an expert for the Delphi technique and obviously conducting interviews. It's not that time consuming and can be very convenient as simply sitting in a circle and talking in a focus group or sending questions off to an expert or an interviewee. We can gain significant rich verbal data, which is amazing. So. I'm just going to jump down to this point here. Often we use qualitative designs if useful, if, if little is known about a topic, sorry. So we can start with qualitative data. Let's talk about what we do know. So let's get, you know, focus group opinions. Let's get expert opinions and get qualitative data and then go from there and then develop more robust experimental designs or observational designs. So we can't do that unless we gain a lot of significant rich verbal data first. So it's certainly not worse or the second or plan B option. Qualitative designs can be the first option and extremely helpful in scientific research. We can get reliable information if, again, we're using the Delphi technique in particular because they are based on expert opinion, they're more qualified, so what they say has more reliable and valid information. And it allows opinions to be expressed on complex issues. So usually with, you know, experimental and observational, we may get a bunch of numbers, but we don't really know why the results actually say what they say. Whereas with qualitative, we can get opinions and people can express their attitudes and why they have behaved a certain way or why they feel that way, which can be very, very useful. However, there are disadvantages. There is absolutely no way we can generalize the results because it's always going to be subjective. So there's no such thing as objective qualitative data, okay? If we use qualitative straight away, the data is going to be subjective. So we can't generalize the results. What I mean by that is we can't apply what's said in one focus group to everybody in the world or everybody in that population, all right? No two people are the same. So because of that, it's only going to be relevant and unique to that focus group with those participants. Same with the Delphi technique. So even though people are experts, one expert may say something slightly different compared to the next expert and so on and so forth. So the goal is to reach consensus, but it may not happen. There may still be differences. So the presence of a facilitator and or others can also affect what is said. This is very common with qualitative design. So if someone is a part of a focus group, they may give what we call, again, socially desirable answers rather than tell the truth about their true opinion or attitude to the topic that's being discussed. So they'll lie, in other words, or sensationalize the truth a little bit. So that may be because of the presence of the facilitator or the others in the focus group. Also, personal bias and, of course, extraneous variables can affect the data with all types. So if someone has a very strong opinion um, regarding a particular topic, it may skew the qualitative data that is obtained. All right. And obviously, we're going to have personal biases or extraneous variables because of participant characteristics when we're doing focus groups, Delphi technique, etc. So we have to always be very mindful of the subjectivity of qualitative designs and the results that we get from them. So easy way to remember the difference between all three designs. Experimental is the design that we control. We have complete control over everything or most things. Observational is the design that we observe. So we have very little control and we're just observing behavior, usually in the natural setting of the participant. 
Qualitative is the design that we discuss. So we talk about it, talk about it in a focus group, talk about it with experts with the Delphi technique or conduct interviews. So if you remember this, you'll be fine. But I hope you found that video useful. As always, if you have any questions, let me know.